Hello everyone and welcome to Skillcapped. I'm Notorious Dub and today I'm going to be giving you 7 tips to help improve your game sense and help you make the right decisions in game and help you come ahead of those difficult scenarios. Before we get started with that though, make sure you hit that subscribe button and turn those bells on so you can stay up to date with all of the comprehensive premium guides that we're putting out to help you stay up to date and ahead of the pack. And be sure to let me know if you want to see more of this or what you want to see next in the comments below. Now, first things first, we have to talk about default rounds because it comes up so often, but honestly, most people just play them wrong. Now, a default setup on attacker side isn't a split up the team and look for kill strategy like most people think it is. A default round is designed to work the map in a methodical way to allow your team to gather as much information as possible to then make a strat call in game to tailor to that specific round. Now, if you want to increase your game sense or even make your game sense useful to the round, you have to stop with the pre-programmed strategies that just end up in a coin flip most of the time. Instead, you should be opting for defaults with specific goals in mind for that round. Something like realizing there aren't many weaknesses in the enemy setup calls for a default, because instead of rushing into a strategy, you instead play the map in pairs and slowly clear the map angle by angle to safely get the enemy to naturally give you control of a certain difficult part of the map, something like showers on bind. With a player now in position deep in showers, your team has the option of pressuring B to allow the showers player to get picks on those rotating enemies to take control of A, or work short so the showers player can be a thorn in the defender's side while you're trying to work that short and the defenders are trying to stop you. Whatever strategy you call after that is up to you, but working the default opens up these opportunities for you to tailor the round to your needs for success for that specific round. Another great opportunity to play default is when you have more money than the enemies, meaning that you have ops and or good guns. In this scenario, you want to play slow for aim battles at a distance, instead of just rushing into an enemy judge and losing the round like that. All in all, you should be implementing defaults more often than not because while pre-programmed strategies are great for a mix-up every now and then, every round is just vastly different, and if you're not accounting for the differences in these rounds, you'll never find consistency in your strategies. Next up, and arguably the most important tip on this list, is to examine the enemy's team comp. Now at this point, most people look for the cipher on the enemy team, and from there just decide what site they want to push and what site they want to avoid. But enemy picks go so much deeper than that, and exploiting their picks can do so much more than just looking for a cipher to avoid on the enemy team. Now for instance, I often see teams without a brimstone or an omen, and without the two most important smoking agents in the game, operators just get that much more effective. And we've probably all realized that ops seem impossible to deal with in a straight up duel, so with no one on the enemy team to block your line of sight, you should be picking up an op for each bomb site. Because if you're holding an angle as a defender with an operator, it almost guarantees that you can get a pick before the enemies rush into sight. And the attackers, without smokes, and even if they have an omen with only the two smokes, they really can't do anything to stop you. Going even further than that though, you should be looking for flashes on the enemy teams. Because a team without flashes lacks the ability to flush enemies out of important areas whenever they're attacking, somewhere like hookah or a u-haul on bind. This just gives you one more advantage as a defender to take control of one more area and or angle that you otherwise wouldn't be able to. And there are so many different variations of this that it would be impossible to go over all of them, but look at the enemy's team comp and figure out what their weakness is and exploit that weakness all game until you get to that 13 round mark. All right, next up we have one of my most asked questions. When should I give up walking and run? And this is usually a very specific question that usually requires a very specific answer, but there are a few guidelines that we can actually go over to help you make the right decision in game. So first of all, you need to recognize what your team's goal is. And if you're on defense, you're going to need to run a lot more often. So let's start with that. As a defender, your number one and main goal is to stop the enemy team from taking the site and getting that plant. So if the enemy team is attempting to force that site and your team has the ability to actually delay the site take and the plant, then you have the luxury of continuing to walk and keep your stealth for your flank and rotation. But if you have any inkling that your team is gonna fold or can't hold the site while you flank, you have to let go of that walk key and get there as fast as possible. As the flanker, you don't have to get all of the kills and finish off the round. Your job is to apply pressure. And once you get there, even if the enemy team knows that you're just behind them, that pressure forces them to take their focus off of the site and deal with you. 
And in a lot of cases, it's actually better that the enemy team knows that you're there because splitting the attacking team is the easiest way for an attack to go sour. So keep in mind that even if the enemies know you're there, it's more important to be there before your team dies because once the enemies take the site, they're going to be watching the flanks anyway and your element of surprise is all for nothing. On attacker side though, it gets a little more nuanced. If it's a retake situation and your team already has the site, the guidelines from before are exactly the same because you're essentially playing defenders now and you just have to get there to help your team. But when your team hasn't taken the site yet and you've managed to slip through the cracks or you're working your flank, you have to be vocal with your team. You have to tell them to not overcommit and just stay put because all they have to do at this point is to apply enough pressure for the enemies to focus on them. That way you can keep your flank going and you can get in position to pick up a few kills and secure that round. All in all though, if the round starts to go bad and your team gets too deep into the fighting, you just have to be there to back them up and stop the round from going sour because a man advantage is often just too much to deal with. All right, so next up, we have a very easy strategy that should guide your decision making almost every round. Look at the enemy's money situation. Now, every round you should be analyzing who could possibly have operators and who isn't going to be able to fully buy. This is one thing that you should always have in the back of your mind because the best way to deal with an operator is to completely avoid it and force that person to play retake with the operator. It's like when you win a round and an enemy on the other team manages to save an op. Just avoid that area altogether and make that operator obsolete because the rest of the team doesn't have very much money and you can just force that person to then have to come and retake the site that you took from the people that were playing there that didn't have the ability to actually buy. But honestly, you should be taking it even deeper than that. After a few rounds of the game, you should have a good grasp on who is playing where on the enemy team. So when you see the agents that can't buy or a couple of agents playing the same bomb site that can't buy, it's time to abuse that area. Now this is even more important for agents with expensive abilities like Sage. A Sage with around 3000 credits has to miss out on something in their buy. And it's the best time to face that Sage head on because she either doesn't have the utility to stop your push or doesn't have the firepower to effectively duel you if you decide to go that route. If all of this fails though, let's be honest, picking the site with the lowest ranked or lowest performing players to pressure is going to be a pretty good strategy for when you just can't get much going in the game. And then next up, I wanted to talk about a very underrated piece of information. You should be taking note of who the enemy lurker is. At this point, honestly, we've all had games where certain members of our team just refuse to group with the team for better or worse. And now a lurker is a very important role for a good attacking or defending team but realizing their patterns as the other team can easily lead to a few one rounds that you probably had no business winning. As an attacker, you can take note of enemies who like to push aggressively, like on Bind. If your team is attacking the B site through Hookah and Long, most of the time an enemy is going to attempt to flank through Market or Spawn. And if you can realize and or predict this pattern and kill that flanker, that means that A site is completely open and your team can leave B and teleport to it to take A virtually for free. This is because once someone pushes aggressively like that and sees that no one's there, the rest of the team is going to rotate out from that site to go help the others on the team to hold down that other bomb site. And this is very similar to how it works as a defender as well. When the enemy team is pushing your B site with an enemy playing short or showers, you have two options. Realize that this agent is the, always the flanker and the rest of their team is likely on the other site because you see them here, or you can take one of your teammates to go kill that flanker. And killing the flanker not only puts you at a man advantage, it also forces the enemies to be paranoid of your team flanking them, effectively making them have another person inactive in the push because someone has to watch the flank so the round doesn't get completely lost to one person slipping through the cracks. So long story short, you should be looking to abuse the flanker, because while it's a very effective role and can carry games if they're doing it correctly, it's also very risky if they're misplaying or doing it incorrectly. And the next up, we have a tip that I wish I knew when I first started playing Valorant. When and how to give up on a push. Now, Valorant is a game that relies heavily on utility to stall out or halt pushes in their tracks. And when this happens, you shouldn't try to ram your head through the wall and force that push. Instead, you should be backing out as much as possible while safely keeping control of that area that you gained. This gives you time to check the flanks, make sure you're safe, take back a little bit of control that you lost elsewhere before you come back maybe 15 seconds later to continue that push if you decide to. 
And don't forget, it's okay for a push to just be a quick probe for information. Because if you see three enemies there, or three enemies worth of utility there, you know the other side is under defended. And instead of slowly backing off and gaining control, you should be bolting to attack the other bomb site instead. And a great strategy for this is to leave one person behind at that original push site to cause problems for any enemy trying to rotate later. Like on split, when your team rushes a bomb site, if this push gets stopped and your team rushes through sewers to mid, you have the perfect opportunity to walk up through ramps into heaven when the enemies start to rotate out. This either gives you an incredible flank to help finish out the round on that B bomb site, or it gives your team a very good backup plan for if their rotation goes sour in some way. Then they can just come back A because you already have that heaven control. And finally, we have a quick tip that I think everyone in Valorant needs to know. When to rush. Now, contrary to popular belief, Valorant just isn't a rushing game. Valorant is a game of opportunity, and you should only be rushing when the opportunities present itself. Opportunities for rushes are when you notice an imbalance in the stacking of the sites, where one site just doesn't quite have the utility to stop you. And with most people knowing team comps decently well at this point, you're going to have to bait out utility first. So while you can rush C site on Haven very easily if the enemy team doesn't have a cipher, most of your rushes are going to come a minute into the round when you've destroyed the tripwires and baited out the sage's utility. Then, and only then, rotating and rushing a site becomes a very viable strategy because you've already baited out all of the site stopping utility that's going to stop you from actually getting onto that site. And another great option to rush is when you get an important pick on an enemy and your team is in position to rush. And an important pick is one that's likely the only person playing that area, like Seasite or a Garage on Haven, or like Catwalk on Ascent. But the most important thing for your rushes is to make sure that your team can back you up. You don't want to get that pick and then rush into the site alone only to trade that kill back and your team is left rotating and then they have nowhere to go because you've lost all control that you just gained. So all in all, you want to make sure that you're doing it as a team, the enemy doesn't have the utility to stop you, and less than half the enemy team is going to be in the area that you decide to rush. And another huge tip for improving your game sense before we end off the video is to go into every round with a goal or an objective in mind. Allow that goal to develop throughout the round, and after every round you should be thinking about what went wrong and what you can do this round to fix that goal and improve for the next round. But let me know in the comments below what tip you found the most helpful and what you want to see from us next. As always, we here at Skillcapped want to thank you for watching and make sure you hit that subscribe button with bells on so you can stay up to date with these comprehensive premium guides to keep you up to date and ahead of the pack. And I just want to say thank you for spending this little bit of your day with us, and I'm Notorious Dub, signing off.